point. So it's now a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, our last speaker, before we go to lunch. And I have to say a big, big thank you to him because I have no idea what time he got home last night because I was watching him on the beginning, the first episode of the 20th uh, series of The Last Leg with Adam Hills and Josh Widdicombe. I missed out the very last section of that. I'm pleased to say, actually, um, when Adam Hills was uh, having a certain uh, procedure, shall we say. Um, he's somebody who you might have seen in 2018. He came and talked to us then. He was absolutely brilliant. He's gone on to do so many different things, as well as, of course, being known mostly for The Last Leg, uh, as I say, 20th series of that. Uh, he also has been involved in many different documents documentaries including Sink or Swim. He's been involved with Scope and lots more. It's a great pleasure to welcome him back to Reach and to speak to him. Uh, he is of course Alex, Alex Brooker. Hello. Hi Alex, how, Hi, are, you? how are you? I'm good. Very good. well, thank you. What I'm, time, I'm what time did you get home? Um, I got home from London uh, about an hour ago, um, so yeah, I'm uh, a bit knackered. It's fine. It's fine. Just to let everyone know this isn't a sauna. <laughs> I mean, this is uh, this is our office uh, that we're getting decorated soon because it's um well it's, it's bleak. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it's great, great to be able to welcome you back. And you've got so many different projects on at the moment. Tell us a little bit about what, what you're up to at the moment and some of the things you're doing. Of course, you know, the last leg taking up a huge amount of your time at the moment too. Yeah, well, we've just started back at uh, the last leg last night. Um, that was our, um, we did a stand up to cancer special. So that was uh, the first one to kick off um, the series. It was, it was nice to be back in the studio with the boys because we did the, the summer series from home. I actually converted um, this office into like a little, uh, a little pub for it. But um, yeah, um, it was lovely to be back with the boys. So we've got, you know, we're running that all the way through till Christmas. Um, we've got a, a US election special coming up. Then we've got a, a New Year's Eve special that we'll be filming. So yeah, at the moment, like my kind of my main priority is, is last leg. I heard a podcast that you're on with Ellis and John. And one of the things that really struck me about that was, you know, talking about comedy and you talk about the way that you approach um, your life and with other people. And you particularly talked about this uh, delivery driver that you bumped into and, and the way that you had some fun with him. And I thought that might be a really valuable thing for people to actually hear about from you, you know, how you deal with certain situations in that way. Well, I think there's, there's some situations where you can't, like, you know, within the realms of my disability, I found myself in so many kind of strange situations that kind of most people, most people wouldn't, that the only way to kind of approach them is, is to be, uh, is to kind of, is with humour. So yeah, I came back from this, uh, this awards dorm, um, had like a bow tie on and my wife wasn't in to take it off for me. And I hadn't even thought of like what I was going to do to take it off. So I'm in the end, I'm buttoning my shirt. I've realised I can't get this bow tie off. I can't rip it off because I don't want to break it. And the only person in the house was the decorator. And I'd only spoken to him twice. I ended up going out to this bloke at like one in the afternoon. It's usually I've spoken to twice. And I was just like, mate, I don't suppose you can do my bow tie for him. Which is quite a confronting thing um, with someone that you don't really know that well. And he was massive as well. So, yeah, it was um, there were things like that. You've got to laugh. Like, there's, there's no point in kind of stressing out about it. Um, it makes for a good story. Yeah, it's a great, great story, Alex. And also, by the way, um, on that, one of the things that I was going to say on the iPlayer at the moment, BBC iPlayer, is Disability and Me. And we actually had a question yeah. coming in about this. And cool. the question was, what prompted you to do that? Because it's, it, it, it's a very, very personal kind of documentary, isn't it? Yeah, um, basically what happened was when I did um, Sink or Swim, uh, in 2019 there was kind of moments when uh, the, at the start when i was struggling in in lake windermere uh to swim and i'll be honest with you when i look back in hindsight now um it was kind of i was just you know i was getting cold water shock it was nothing to do with the size of my arms or the fact i had one leg um it's the fact that channel 4 got us to swim in 15 degree water with only 30 seconds preparation which is um quite frankly dangerous uh, so yeah there was part of but when i was in windermere um you know i got really upset and i kind of straight away became very frustrated and i got so upset and i kind of thought to myself afterwards that actually maybe you know some of this 
some of this has probably been building up for a while, kind of frustration about my disability, and I hadn't felt like that for years. I mean, you're talking like 10 or so years, like ever since I stopped playing football. That was probably the last time I'd really felt kind of restricted by my disability. And I, I, I got very emotional on the show and, and I kind of thought to myself afterwards that maybe, you know, it was time to kind of have a little chat about it. You know, I'll go, I'll go and see uh, a therapist and I have been for a while now and kind of those sort of things that I've learned about myself, I felt able now to have that conversation. Um, and luckily, uh, Seven Wonder, the company that made the documentary, I did an NHS program for them in 2018 and, and they kind of were happy to make it. And do you know what, it was tough. It was a tough thing to do. Um, you know, what you see on the, on the documentary, it's very raw. And that's because a lot of the conversations are as they were at the time. There wasn't any, you know, in TV, you can, you can set up an interview and you can kind of have pre-chat, oh, you're going to say this and stuff like that. But with, with um, Disability and Me, it was done as it was. It was done live. So even the scene with my mum when we're looking over the, the photos of me from when I was in Great Ormond Street, when I was little, we'd never done that before. We didn't have a chat before it. We kind of just went in and filmed it. And that's why it was so raw. The scene where I go in and see the surgeon, I hadn't seen a leg surgeon for, gosh, like since 2003. So you're talking like 17 years. It's the first time I'd seen him. And it was just, you know, it was filmed as it was. And that's why kind of these things, it was so raw. And I think that, you know, it kind of at times, you know, must have been a bit of a hard watch. It was certainly hard to do. But at the same time, it was, uh, it was very rewarding. Um, there's, you know, I got something out of it. I learned a lot about myself. Um, I got to talk about how I really feel about certain aspects of my disability, which I hadn't done in general, let alone on television. And it's a mad thing with me because a lot of the conversations I've had about my disability have been on telly. They've been on the last leg. They, they were on, you know, on disability and me. And I suppose when you do that and you put it out there for the public, it, there's an element of vulnerability to it. But, you know, I, I really got a lot out of it. And it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it was something very different for me to do. Like, for example, last night I ended up, uh, on last leg like dressed as a cinema usher giving out popcorn while Adam had a prostate exam and don't get me wrong it's all for a good cause but I didn't get as much out of that as what, <laughs> that's what I did from doing the documentary <laughs> you know I'm, I'm just trying to lose that image now so uh, thank, thanks very much <laughs> yeah, for that Alex just much just appreciated put that out for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that. actually turning to a slightly lighter subject and I'm not sure how this really segues but we'll give it a go we've had a question from James age six and he just wants to yeah. know, what's it like being on telly? Um, it's all right. It's decent. <laughs> it's good fun. Um, it's it's probably the it's the, comfortably the hardest job I've done, but it, it, it's it's a lot of fun. It's you know it's stressful. I, you know I think people see like kind of like last leg last night, and it's all a good, it's all a laugh, and we're sat there, and I'm kind of laughing and stuff like that, but. I can't say I'd forgotten like in the last kind of six months since we've been away from the studios how much it takes out of me doing live television because you're on and you're so worried about what you're going to say and even last night I kind of said said something about this geezy plus Tottenham and I just straight away wished I hadn't said it because I just forgot where I was forgot what I was saying and it's so stressful it's so it is and it kind of takes it out of you but at the same time it, it's it's a lot of fun it is you know the the coronavirus stuff has made the world hard for for everyone and kind of television's um no different it is weird it's weird not being able to kind of hug all hug the lads when i saw them i hadn't seen them since march so but yeah telling is it's, it's fun and believe me the standards in television are not as high as what people <laughs> might think so just bear that in mind they really will put any old rubbish on yeah, thank, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> um, actually, by the way, there's, there's loads of comments coming in, loads of questions coming in. First of all, um, you talk about TV appearances. You've done numerous TV appearances, including Tipping Point, Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. But a big, a big thank you to you for actually donating your winnings on uh, Tipping Point to Reach. So uh, a big thank you to that. Yeah. I was I was really gutted about tipping point. I got knocked out by Joey Essex, which is absolutely crazy. <laughs> um, I was flying at one point. I honestly thought oh, I'll hold back a little bit. Um, he got like one question right and managed to drop like the most counters I've ever seen on the show. And I got knocked out in the first round, so I didn't win uh, as much as what I've what I'd like. 
but um don't worry the next show i'll do i'll make up for it i'll, I'll get us some decent some decent uh cash for the charity because yeah that was that was frustrating very frustrating i was on the train home from bristol about an hour later scan got knocked out by joey essex <laughs> i just kept saying over and over again in my head so um there's yeah, no justice was, in again, the world is there <laughs> no, no there's not um there was it was a lot of it was a lot of fun though but my face was a picture loads of questions and, and these are you have to excuse them these are all coming in sort of random things i just want to get through as many Please as we can feel free. um one chuck of them, them, chuck them at me. when you were doing sink or swim somebody just asked did you see any jellyfish <laughs> um yeah i've got one um they i think they uh cut it out of the actual edited show when we were in the channel because um i said a word that you're not allowed to say on television <laughs> even at that time at night um so basically i was doing backstroke it was pitch black and i felt I thought it was seaweed around my arm and I kind of thought, tried to flick it and then it tensed and then I realised it was a jellyfish. I had a swimsuit on so luckily it wasn't like, um, I didn't get like a really bad sting but I saw it was a jellyfish, it was right by my face as well and I screamed, like I, I screamed to Ross, the coach, I was just like, get it off me, get it off me, and, like flung my arm out and it's like jellyfish just kind of, yeah. Went um went flying so uh, yeah no I, was, I saw I saw one it was it was horrible uh, honestly when you're when you're on your back and it's pitch black and you don't know like you're it messes up with your senses and you're just kind of swimming and you're kind of just trying to get on with it and just try and focus on something positive and it was the idea of that like, that one of them could like any moment just float across your face is absolutely horrendous um it was the worst part of the swim comfortably is the is the fear of uh, the old jellyfish i had these things on my hands i had like little gloves on um and then i had like something on my actual foot that was exposed just to try and uh, yeah eliminate the the chances of being stung by a jellyfish but about a week before the channel i kept thinking i was going to get swallowed by a whale or something <laughs> I don't know how many whales anyone's ever spotted in the channel, but I kept thinking I'm the sort of person who like that would happen to, and it's like that does. I, just my mind was going all over the place. But yeah, I got I got uh, an encounter with a jellyfish. Well, I think you can be easily forgiven for any inappropriate words given those circumstances. <laughs> yeah. um, coming back to disability and me, we've had a really good question coming in. Obviously, you know, really appreciating your openness and you know frankness during that documentary. But the question was about the conversation that you had afterwards as a result of maybe friends, family watching that. Were there any conversations that maybe didn't actually happen before, but as a result of them seeing that documentary, it maybe reignited some conversations? I think for a lot of my pals, they were kind of, I think there were parts of it that had kind of, that had shocked them a, a little, that kind of all this stuff that I kind of, I'd gone through, there was a scene that what didn't make it into the documentary, but kind of me and my best friend Paul, we, we talked about how um, uh, how hard it was for me when I was getting operations done on my legs, when we were at school and, and I was in a wheelchair for it and kind of those times when, you know, I was, around that time when I, you know, I realised that I wasn't going to be able to keep really playing football like I wanted to, even at like a five-a-side level. And I remember kind of that, I'd never spoken about that at the time, but we did in, in the documentary and he was kind of, you know, we're like 36 now and he'd, he'd spent the last 20 years having no idea that that's, that's, that's what I went through at the time. And I think for some of my mates, it was quite hard for them to think, oh, you didn't say anything. And, you know, again, with, with my mum, it was, you know, there were conversations that were we, we had that were quite, were quite difficult. Um, and I think that, you know, we've always had quite an open relationship. But again, there's some conversations we, we hadn't really had. But then, you know, it's just I, I ended up having them. And whether I had them late, you know, later than what maybe I, I wish I had of, you know, ultimately, I've still managed to have them, and and that and that's and that's the good thing. And now it's kind of you know, it's an open, it's an open slate. You know, I'm I'm lucky. I've got very supportive people around me, um, and stuff like that. You know, it's only only last night, only last night when I got in from work, I kind of te I was texting my boss at work, and I was just saying, you know, I don't feel as confident at the moment. You know, I feel like everything I'm doing is rubbish, and it's like, well, no, it's actually you're doing all right, and it's kind of I'm actually now very. I'm able to articulate how I feel and that's that's a big thing and of course that's a big thing that's come from the documentary. 
And, you know, you've achieved so much, Alex, and uh, have been an absolute inspiration to so many people. And you probably get asked this all the time, but it's a question that's come in, and I think it's a really valid question as well, is what do you feel is your proudest moment to date? Obviously, there's lots of things ahead, and actually I'd love to hear in a while about some of your goals and other things you'd like to achieve. But for the moment, what, what for you is the proudest moment to date? So no, it's, it's a tough one. Obviously, I've, I've got to say my kids. <laughs> <laughs> having two kids is, is pretty was obviously it was a proud moment just going to put that out there before i list the other stuff <laughs> but um having my kid having the girls um were you know were, were proud moments even if i was hung over when the second one arrived but um yeah uh, um i think that in terms of kind of my career um you know just getting onto channel four in the first place um that first moment of going on television at, at the Paralympic opening ceremony, like interviewing, you know, David Cameron, who was the then prime minister, like that was my first appearance on live television and I didn't crumble. And that's a, you know, I'm still kind of proud of that. And there are times, I'll be honest with you, when I look back and I miss, I miss the way that I felt when I first started television, the days before I knew that people would be horrible to you on Twitter. <laughs> Like those sorts of days where I worried about what the audience thought. I was just wanted, I was just myself and I just wanted to, it was so exciting to be on television and I had none of these other worries. There was no career moves, tactical moves. Should I do this for this channel? Am I going to annoy this channel? It was all just excitement. Wow, I'm on the telly. And I really do, you know, sometimes I miss that. I miss that. But that was, you know, that was that was when I just thought I was blagging it. And now it's like a proper job. So in terms of other stuff in my, in terms of, you know, the other stuff in my career, the awards are great. The awards are, are, are good and, and they're amazing. And Last Legs won, won the load. And, and that's that's great. But I think the stuff that I'm proud of, you know, I get messages from, from people who, you know, parents and sometimes... Uh, you know, young people as well who say that I've, I've helped them feel better about themselves. You can't really, there can't be anything more that you can do. Like, yeah, all right, maybe I wouldn't mind a BAFTA, but apart from that, <laughs> there's not more. There's no more that I can, I can do to have helped someone because, you know, and I don't mean this in an arrogant way at all, but like when I was kind of 15, for, you know, like a, a teenager, there was, I, there weren't any, there wasn't anyone like who, was really disabled on television and, and I kind of thought I had a misconception that actually maybe society didn't want us on there and that was that's a really sad way to feel growing up that's like I look back at times like that and especially the documentary highlighted that and I kind of look back at times and the way I used to feel about myself and it was like it's sad I feel sad kind of yeah I feel, I feel Blimey, I get emotional when I talk about it. I feel sad when I look back because I, I want to say to that Alex, like, don't worry, mate. You can get on the telly. You know, you can you can do all these amazing things. You'll have a wife, like you'll have kids and stuff like that. And you know, back then, you know, I remember how I felt, and I didn't think, you know, I'd I'd get I'd, I'd achieve all of these things. I never thought that, you know, I don't know that, you know, kind of certainly with relationships and stuff like that. I'm kind of slightly digressing, but there's so many things I wish I could tell myself. And I think that for me, to be able to, to go on and like help other people, that's like, you can't get any, there will be, I will achieve no more than that. Absolutely no more. Alex, thanks, thanks so much for sharing that. And uh, you know, what you expressed there is what so many other people within the REACH family have experienced and felt and whatever they went on to do will have gone through those same moments. And I just want to come back, if I may, to your greatest achievement, your two daughters. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you said in that interview, in that podcast that I heard, you were talking about how having children changed your perspective on yourself and, you know, thinking about how your parents you know, dealt with the fact that they had a child who was different. Maybe you could share that a little bit because I think that that would be really helpful for other parents out there. Yeah, so I've just, I've just stopped myself going once. I'm going to go into talking about my <laughs> Sorry, kids. I didn't mean to do um, that to you. That's all right, mate. It's all right. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, when I when I think about the kids, it did, it changed, it, it, it changed me 
c- completely. And I don't mean that, by the way. Sometimes, uh, you know, this idea that you, you only learn empathy when you have kids and stuff like that, I think it's an absolute load of rubbish. It's like, you know, uh, but I feel that for me personally, you know, having having the girls, especially, you know, it's like I mentioned before when I kind of got sad, is that, you know, someone who didn't think that I'd ever be, you know, I'd have kids or... You know, the, the, I talked in in the podcast the other day, and, and I said before about you know worrying about how the girls would, or how my future children would even perceive me. Would they be scared of my hands and stuff like that? And this is no one's ever said that to me. No one ever said to me. By the way, you know, I'm, we're slightly worried that you know your your kids in the future might be scared, might be wary of the fact that you're different. No one ever said that to me. It's kind of like a it, it was something kind of very self-conscious thought that kind of came to me early on. And, you know, I've learned through through having the children that all of these worries that I had weren't just worries of a disabled man with kind of short arms and, and, and my hands and my leg. They're just worries that people go through. I worried about holding... Um, the girl I heard about holding my baby when we whatever you know whenever that was going to be and then you know I held my, my daughter Mia for the first time and do you know what it was no problem and I remember my friend Paul saying to me well everyone worries about that so that was just a worry that all parents have what's the worst thing you can do drop your kid as soon as you get it you know what I mean and it's like that's just a that's a parent worry that's not a disabled bloke worry and it's the same with you know with with worrying about whether they'll be wary uh, of my hands you know, I just, I think all parents want their kids to think they're, they're cool and stuff like that. And I, I think then there's an element an element of that that comes into it. And that's just a, a kind of a parent worry. But I obviously put a lot more on myself because it's my own insecurities about being, being disabled and about being the way I am. And in fact, actually, you know, I kind of, I spoke about it, you know, years, God, like 25 years or so of worrying about what maybe, uh, you know, my future child may think about my hands and like my daughter Mia when she noticed them she just said um I was holding her hand she went you've got two fingers and I've got more haven't I and I was just like yeah that was it that's the conversation done and it was almost like you know I did want the. I was like Come, you must have some more questions than that I've been building up to this for enough time you got any more and she was like she couldn't have cared less she just wanted to go in the stream and that's the beauty of and the innocence of children they don't have you know they don't care they don't they don't have that kind of that insecurity and that, and that self kind of self-consciousness you don't have that when you're that age so they just don't care i'm just their dad and that's an amazing kind of thing for me and it's it's these worries that have kind of dissipated over as time's gone on and i feel very fortunate i'm, I'm so fortunate that i feel the way i do now about about myself uh, i think that you know i i could never have imagined that when i was 14 or, or 15. Uh, Alex, really appreciating your time here. You must be pretty tired, but we're really appreciating the time. Um, oh, no, you're all right, mate. Just want to talk a little bit about the future. Uh, we've had a question come in um, asking, first of all, are you going to uh, swim the channel again? And what other plans have you got for... <laughs> yeah. uh, go, and, go and say hello to that jellyfish again. And um, <laughs> then what about other plans, other, maybe other dreams and goals that you have? Um, I, I mean, in terms of swimming the channel again, I actually, during lockdown, the first, I started swimming a lot more again, and uh, I got a lot quicker. So, you know, when I did the channel swim, I did like just over a mile in the first hour before the storm hit. And like midway through lockdown, I was kind of doing a, a mile in about 40 minutes, which is fairly quick. I, I got really quick and nailed my technique finally. And I thought to myself, I did text Ross the coach and I was like, Maybe I should just do it on me on my own. Let's have a crack at it, and that lasted like about a day. And then I started thinking about the jellyfish again. I thought, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Um, so that's kind of on the back burner for now. Also, it is you know what we did with the channel with the relay. That was eight weeks training. I was injured for four of those, so I had four weeks training. And it's like you know people do two years, and kind of Ross said to me, it's two years proper training. Don't you can't half you know half bake it and stuff like that. And I was just like, sounds like a lot of effort. And then I kind of carried on watching telly. But in terms of other goals that I've got, um, I kind of I don't know. I'd like to kind of I I think getting my own show at some point is is an ultimate goal. I think that's the same for every person on television. As as much as I I love the last leg. 
I, you know, I, I would love to, to kind of have more of my own vehicles and that's something that we're working towards kind of, of you know, kind of working towards what launching a YouTube channel and, and, and stuff like that. And also, I, I, you know, ideally I'd like to kind of do a sitcom. I think they're, you know, we're getting better with disability representation in, in soaps and dramas, but I feel like there's still a massive gap and someone's going to do it and someone's going to nail it. And everyone's going to go, why haven't we been doing this this whole time? You know, all the, you know, disabled people just doing, living normal lives. It's not even about their disability. And it's like seeing something so simple, but it's so rarely done on the telly these days. And I, I kind of, that's the sort of thing, that's my goal. So I'm working on ideas uh, for that as well. And then other than that, I think I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get a game for Arsenal anytime soon. <laughs> that was the only other goal I, I really had. So, um, yeah, no, that was. Uh, I've kind of might have to put that one on the back burner. Well, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you on TV on your own show. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back at uh, Tipping Point as well. Maybe uh, this time you can beat Joey Essex and uh, donate all that <laughs> money to reach. But in the meantime, Alex, okay. we're going to see you later on uh, for the Ambassadors panel. Um, I know more questions are going to come up then, but for the moment, thank you so much indeed for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks very much thank indeed. Thank you very much, mate. Alex Cheers. Brooker, thank you.